custodians of the land on which we meet, albeit virtually today. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would like to extend that respect to all First Nations people here today. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and will be made available in the coming days to be viewed if you would like to rewatch anything or if you're having any technical problems tonight. Um, we will have a chance to answer questions throughout the presentation by putting your questions in the chat box. We've allocated some time at the end and we'll attempt to, to answer them. We do have quite a number of people um, that uh, on, on the webinar, so we, we'll, we'll do our best to get through the questions. We're in there also in our final stage of developing a comprehensive confinement feeding manual, which will be emailed to all participant registered uh, once we finalise it. If you're watching a recording of this webinar, the manual will be posted on the Central Tablelands LS website for you to access, hopefully by the end of October. The funding to be able to present this webinar has been provided from the Australian Government through the National Land Care Program. I now hand across to Brett Littler, who, um, who can and, um, to commence the webinar. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, yes. Um, look, confinement feeding is something that we've seen really gain a lot of interest over the last few years, but it's been around for a long, long time. Um, tonight, we're, we're pretty lucky. We've got uh, Jeff House and Jeff Duddy, both well recognised within the industry to uh, present this evening on confinement feeding. Uh, they, with myself, were also heavily involved in the uh, compiling of the manual that we're, we're hoping to have out in October. Um, just a little bit of background on our presenters tonight. Uh, I won't actually be presenting. My name's Brett Littler. I'm uh, uh, livestock role in the Central Tablelands. Um, was a beef cattle officer with the department, but joys of being in Mudgee tended to do both sheep and beef. Um, both Jeff's tonight, Jeff House and Jeff Duddy, had the uh, pleasure or the misfortune, depending on, on which day you ask them, of uh, working with me uh, for, for a number of years. Um, and in that time, uh, Jeff House specialised in beef cattle feeding and nutrition, and Jeff Duddy specialised in, in sheep uh, feeding and nutrition, but also particularly in sheep feed lots as well. So I'll hand over the, now to uh, to Jeff House to uh, kick off his presentation. Thanks, Jeff. And as we go through, as we get the questions, Jeff, I will hold them to the end and I'll try to compile them and come back at you with, with the questions. No, that sounds good. Thank you very much, Brett. And yeah, thank you very much to um, the Central Tablelands Local Land Services, uh, to both Brett and Pete. Uh, this well, the the manual has been a, a, an ongoing project for a while now, and um, now it's been great to to work with Brett again, and, and Pete, and and also Jeff Duddy. So, look, welcome to the sea to everyone to this evening's uh, webinar. I just got um, a couple of topics that I, I'm going to cover up front here. Um, so a little bit on on what is confinement feeding, um, some of the regulations and requirements that are around uh, feeding cattle and sheep in these type of situations. Uh, a little bit about site selection and then also stocking densities. So we'll, we'll jump straight in. So what is confining confinement feeding? Um, look, it, it's when stock are confined in either small paddocks or pens, uh, it doesn't really matter which, for full hand feeding and management during drought. Uh, that's the the crux of what we're, we're talking about is that management of cattle and sheep during drought. Um, it's really the, the key objectives of confinement feeding are about maintaining your, your herd or your flock productivity. Um, and that's a really key, we, we're not doing this just to keep stock alive or just to maintain stock. These setups are there so that we actually maintain the productivity of our animals. But we also want to reduce the grazing pressure over the whole property. So. If we leave stock out in large paddocks and just allow them to, which in some cases is the first response that producers have when, when things start to get a bit tight, they open a few more gates and give stock a bit more of a roam, then that has both negative implications for the animals and also for our pastures. So one of the real advantages of, of confinement feeding it's really around that reducing the grazing pressure. So we're trying to reduce topsoil or nutrient loss from our paddocks. We're 
trying to reduce that grazing pressure so that we don't remove so much of the, the biomass there that we, we you know, expose more topsoil and then potentially have issues with erosion and nutrient loss. Also that damage that happens to the pasture, especially uh, to perennial pastures. So we're really trying to get our stock off those pastures early enough that we, we actually maintain enough ground cover there that when we do have a rainfall event, that that remaining pasture can actually respond and, and react and, and make use of that rainfall event. We also reduce our livestock energy requirements by confining them. Those animals that are, are given big areas to, to roam and graze, they, they'll spend a long time grazing, trying to find that little bit of pick. And they're actually using more energy trying to do that just in moving around. And most of the time, you know, once we get into those really low um, ground covers, the, the stock just can't find enough feed in a day anyway to meet their requirements. So um, by confining them, we, we reduce their requirements and, and we're better able to manage them. We also can reduce the spread of introduced weeds. So if we're actually buying feeds in, whether it's grain or, or hay or the likes onto our property, by confining our stock into a smaller area and feeding in those smaller areas, then it makes it much easier from an entire biosecurity point of view to keep an eye out for any introduced weeds or, or pests or anything. So there's some really big advantages in that rather than again, feeding right across the property and spreading um, potential introduced weeds and like right across. It allows us to maintain our core breeder base. So that's, that's a real key in a lot of situations is, is that ability to maintain those animals. Um, it also allows us to maintain or improve weight and condition. So again, we're feeding, and, and Jeff will, will start to talk a little bit about feeding later on this evening. Um, you know, we're feeding animals to to maintain their productivity, and, and you know, for young stock, we're we're feeding them to grow and and to com continue to perform. Um, we can improve conception and weaning rates uh, by you know improving the condition of our, our females and. And, and the job that they do on the, their progeny at foot. And it also allows us to monitor stock a lot better. If, if we've got them in a confined space, it makes that monitoring much easier and, and we're able to do that. Of course, there are some, some negatives. Um, you know, we're in a full feeding situation, so that does take a lot of feed and, you know, there's a cost involved in that. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the advantages do far outweigh the, the disadvantages when it's done in a strategic and a, and a calculated way. So in terms of the regulations um, in New South Wales, it, the stock um, confinement areas uh, under the legislation or, or the planning policy, um, they're referred to as stock containment areas. And the, the policy that we're, we're interested in, it's the state environmental planning policy uh, for primary production and rural development from 2019. Um, so you'll sometimes see that referred to as the SEP for primary production and rural development. And what it states is that where producers are able to undertake necessary farm management operations to temporarily hold, feed and water livestock. So one of the key words there is temporarily. So it's not meant to be a, an ongoing um, sort of permanent uh, operation where you, you're feeding animals in a in a intensive form, but where it's, there's an allowance there to do it during or immediately following drought, flood, fire, or any other emergency event. Or there's another exemption there for, for routine husbandry. So, you know, we can, we can confine feed and water livestock for weaning, for dipping, drenching, breeding, prior to sale. Any of those sort of options we're allowed to do. And Provided it's used on a temporary basis, it's outside an environmentally sensitive area and recommendation or, or part of this regulation says, you know, that our confinement area can't be any closer than 100 metres to a watercourse or 500 metres to a neighbouring dwelling, then development consent is not required for confinement feeding areas. So this generally um, development consent for a feedlot, for example, in the first instance is through your local council. Um, in this case, for confinement feeding areas, provided they meet those criteria, they do not require consent. 
So there's no local government approval or anything that's required there. If, however, um, it's deemed to be a feedlot, and, and within that SEP, there is actually um, the definition of a feedlot, and it's it's more around um, the intent of that operation, which is to, to feed longer term, to, to really to finish cattle and, and feed them for meat, uh, milk or, or production. Um, if it's for more than 50 head of cattle or 200 sheep, more sheep or goats, then that does require development consent. So there is, there's a, you know, distinction there. If it's being done as a drought management strategy um, to do the things we've said before, you know, about removing grazing pressure uh, to maintain and, and, you know, maintain production in our animals, then that's fine. Um, if it really goes that step further and it's operating for a longer period of time and is deemed to be a feedlot, then it does require development consent. So it, it's just important people realise that. If you do develop a, a containment feeding area or a confinement feeding area and you, you at a later date want to turn it into a feedlot, um, then you do need to go through that development application and, and the consent process. So um, there is a little bit to that. Now, what I want to talk about next, um, a little bit about site selection for our, um, our confinement feeding area. And look, really, we want to integrate this into our overall property layout. Um, if we're going to spend money in, in developing this and building the, the structure, um, possibly feed troughs and the like, then we really need to make sure that we integrate it into our whole property. And the fact that we can use it for weaning um, and possibly some other management um, practices, you know, during the year, not just in a drought, um, means that again we, we've got to got to think about how it's going to fit into the whole the whole operation. And look, often when it comes to site selection, we we can't get the perfect site on every property, so there are often some compromises that need to be made. But some of the things we need to really consider. So things like the buffer or separation distances, and I'll, I'll show a few more details on that in a second. The topography and soil type of the area, um, access, and again, I'll, I'll touch on a number of these again, proximity to facilities. Access to water is really, really important. Um, so we need to be able to source good, clean water for the stock. And of course, it can't be um, through a creek or a river. Um, we, we need to be away from those sites. So. Yeah, you know, we don't generally recommend dam water either because dams will, will tend to dry and and cause more issues um, for the stock. So we don't recommend stock having access to a dam. Um, so we need to be able to to get water to the site. Shelter and aspect are important so that the animals are, are protected. Um, and ideally, you know, we we don't really want it on a on a southern aspect um, where it's going to be really really cold during those winter months. Um, and the other thing to think about is just residues that might be around some of those um, organic chlorates and the like that might be old dip sites, old, um, if you've got old house sites on your property, um, you know, we don't want to be putting stock in intensive areas in those sort of places where they may be exposed to residues, even power poles. Uh, if you've got power poles that have been there for a long time, it's best to avoid putting them um, with power poles in the pens just because it, it will greatly increase the risk of residues. Just in relation to buffer distances, um, what we're aiming to do there is, is just ensure that the runoff from the site does not contaminate any natural water courses, water storage or your neighbour's properties. Uh, neighbour's property. Look, it, it's really worth considering too the distance to your own property um, in terms of of these distances, your own house isn't included in it, um, but you know houses on neighbouring properties most definitely are. So you know we don't put it too close to your own own house. Ideally, we we want it above the one in a hundred year flood height, um, because you know there, there will be manure generated, there will be effluent generated at this site. So we're we're trying to to limit the impact that it might have, um, the impact of odour, dust, noise, impact insects. Um, just the, the amenity of the whole site. We're, we're trying to minimise any impacts that they might have on, on neighbours and the like. And so, you know, if you can keep it 500 metres away from, from boundaries and watercourses and the like, that's great. Um, in the reference manual, it, it, some of the distances are smaller than that. Um, 
So, you know, it's it's only sort of 100 metres and, and 200 metres from different types of water courses. Um, but ideally, if, if you can keep 500 metres, that's great. Um, it is a minimum of 500 metres, but from a, a neighbouring dwelling. So that, that is the, um, the the minimum distance from, from a neighbouring house. So the, the more distance you've got between your, your confinement feeding area and, and any neighbours, the better. The topography um, and the soil types in the area are also really important. So topography really is going to influence the drainage and erosion potential of the site. Um, ideally, we want some slope so that we assist with runoff and avoid ponding or, or bogging sort of conditions, boggy conditions. Two to four percent slope is ideal. Um, we really try to avoid flat areas or drainage lines where, where water is going to be um, really in, introduced into the site and cause more problems. Ideally, near the top of the slope is preferred. So, you know, if you're up higher on the slope, then there's less water um, or runoff actually coming above your site that's potentially going to flow through the confinement feeding area. Um, of course, that can be allayed by contour banks or the like. So, you know, if you've got contour banks already on your property, you know, if you, if you place your confinement feeding area just below a contour bank, um, that will limit the amount of water that's entering from the top. Um, and from a soil top type point of view, look, a medium clay loam is, loam is ideal. Um, it's, it's got that ability to compact and, and form a, a fairly impermeable layer. But if the clay content is too heavy, so if we go to heavy clays, then they tend to pug up and, and take a really long time to dry out. Whereas if we go the opposite way and you've got a really light soil, um, then it's much more prone to erosion and, and wind erosion and the like. So, you know, ideally a medium clay loam, but again, sometimes they, these are compromises. So just that image there at the bottom of the screen, you know, this is a, a relatively straightforward, simple setup. It, it probably is a little bit too flat um, and a little bit at the bottom of the slope. So, you know, I, I tend to harp on about this a little bit. Most of the time we're going to be using these operations, it's going to be dry and, you know, it's during drought. But of course, when it rains, it doesn't rain feed. So we need to continue to feed for a number of weeks. And with cattle, that could be maybe six, maybe eight weeks after it's rain before there's sufficient feed in the paddock to actually allow those animals back out. So we do really need that ability for our confinement feeding area to, to stand up when, um, when it does get wet. And so hence why we're talking so much about drainage and soil types uh, for those sort of conditions. This is a, an example of a site that, you know, it's got a good slope on it. Um, down below there, there's a bit of a contour bank as well. So any runoff that comes off here is actually captured and, and is directed towards a, a little dam that's there as well. So that, that's an ideal situation where, you know, you're, you're up on the slope, but you're actually able to catch any of that runoff and manure and the like that, that comes off that site before it goes down into any creeks or the like. So, you know, topography is really important. As I've already mentioned, that all weather access is just critical. Um, you know, when it rains, we need to be able to firstly get to our confinement feeding area. So, you know, we need a, a good tracks, good roads to get there, um, but we also need to be able to feed out. And anybody that's that's used um, these sort of tow behind feeders behind a tractor in wet weather, um, they do tend to get a mind of their own. And, you know, if it's wet and slippery, they can be quite difficult to um, to keep going in a straight line on the, on the straight and narrow. So we really need to, to be aware of the, the conditions. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later tonight as well with some of the, the pen designs that we look at, um, that can have a big impact as well. This is an example of a, a setup that, that was built um, where they actually put, um, to improve access, they actually put um, some stock grids in here as well so they didn't have to get in and open gates and the like all the time. Probably a little bit, you know, it's a reasonable size area, um, you know, a bit, bit expensive, but that that aided in their, their speed of feeding. Proximity to facilities is really important if you can, um, you know, if you can make it close to existing yards and, and feed storages. Yards so that you don't have to take cattle a long distance or sheep a long distance to your confinement feeding area from your yard. So you can bring them in, weigh them, do normal um, procedures to them and then don't have to take them a long way back to confinement feeding. And if you get sick animals, then, you know, potentially you can use your existing yards. And being close to feed storage areas really reduces the time that it takes to feed and, and monitor stock. So, 
Um, if you don't have to travel long distances from your feed storage to your confinement area, that reduces the time it takes to feed quite considerably. Um, this is actually the same uh, image or same setup that I, I had a moment ago with the um, with the stock grid. Um, you know, that's their shed at the bottom of the hill there and, and their feeding facility. So it was really nice and close, nice and easy. Um, the house isn't too far away either. So, you know, it's a balancing act between siding it close enough to, to the house so that you're observing the stock regularly. Um, you know, you, you're really wanting to be observing them at least once a day, ideally a couple of times a day, um, but not too close that you um, you start to cause headaches for yourself and from, from odour and flies and the like. So it is a bit of a balancing act. Just now sort of moving on to the, talking about a little bit about stocking densities. So when we, um, when we look at confinement feeding areas, we tend to talk about stocking densities in terms of the area that we allow per head. So sometimes you hear people talk about stocking rates and, and the like when they're talking about uh, paddocks or, or properties, but really from a confinement feeding area, we start to talk about stocking densities and it's, it's an area per head that we're allowing for the animals. So these are some um, recommended values so for sheep or lambs, we're rec recommending sort of at least five square metres per head. Uh, for weaner cattle, nine to 10 metres squared per head. Yearling cattle, 12 to 15. Dry cows, 15 to 25. Ewes with lambs at foot or, or cows with calves at foot. So um, ewes as they're approaching lambing and then once they've got lambs at foot and, and cows approaching calving and with calves at foot, we don't recommend them being fed in pens, so in, in tighter um, settings. Ideally, that's where the small paddocks are ideal. Um, for sheep, lambs, weaners, yelling cattle or dry cattle, pens work really, really well. Um, but for females with, with young at foot, um, and, and also during the lambing or the calving process, those females like to get away from the mob um, and, and you know move away when they're, they're going through that process. So in a pen, that's really difficult and you, you can, you know, especially with ewes and lambs, end up with a lot of mismothering um, if in they're in a pen situation. So recommend small paddocks for those animals and, you know, so it's 100 plus metres squared per, per head. In the pens, it really is a balance between dust and, and mud, the pen getting too wet. So um, if we give the animals a lot of space, so a lot more space than what's recommended here, then we do tend to end up in a situation where there's a lot of dust produced in the yards. That can lead to respiratory issues and, and health issues with the animals. But if we go much below these sort of numbers, or if we start to have rainfall events, then just the manure and the urine that the animals are putting onto the pen will start to to create uh, a wet environment. So, you know, it is that bit of a balancing act. If, if we've got the animals at about the right um, area per head, then that urine and manure that's going onto the pad actually helps to control dust and maintain that pad in the pen. Uh, if we go too far either way, the other side, then we can run into problems. So uh, it is a bit of a balancing act. And it will vary a little bit based on your soil type as well. Um, so, you know, if you, your soil type's a little bit on the lighter side of ideal, then, you know, you're probably going to end up with a little bit more, more dust. Um, and so you're probably going to want to stock those, those pens a little bit heavier. Uh, so a, the smaller end of the, the area per head. Um, whereas if you've got a slightly heavier soil, you might be able to go, go to the bigger numbers. We talk, and this is the last slide I've got for this section. It, if we start talking about mob sizes, so how many stock we put together um, in a mob, in a confinement pen or, or in a small paddock, for example. Um, ideally, we're suggesting a maximum of about 350 lambs. Um, ewes and lambs really don't want them in, in mob sizes of any more than about 500. Uh, for weaner cattle, I, I recommend sort of between 50 to 100 head in a mob and for, for cows and, and yearling cattle, older cattle, between 100 and, and 200 in a, in a mob is, is a pretty good number. But look, the bigger the mob, the more difficult it is to, to actually 
um, maintain or, or keep those animals nice and even, make sure they're all getting feed, um, and, and just to monitor those animals really as well as we'd like to. But of course, um, if, if we end up with a whole heap of really small mobs, then we need more pens, more feeding. Um, you know, it, it, it again is a balancing act between the two. So it really does depend on, on your operation, on, on how the, set, the setup, how, how good it is, um, and what sort of numbers you can easily handle. But really don't recommend people going to too big a groups of animals. It, it does just make that ability to monitor them and to ensure that all animals are, are getting fed, because most of the time, with most of our classes of stock, we're not feeding them ad lib. So we're not feeding them as much as they can possibly eat. We're, we're trying to restrict feeding a little bit. So, um, you know, smaller groups make that a lot easier. Just in terms of then taking that step fur further, and I'll, I'll follow on from this with my next presentation, um, where I talk about designing these sort of facilities. So we've got to take into account the diagram there on the right. Um, so, you know, how big our pens are going to be, how big we make our pens, really to some extent depends on what your likely mob sizes are going to be and the area per head. So, for example, here, um, if we've got a pen that's 50 metres deep and 30 metres wide, then that's 1,500 square metres. If we're allowing five square metres per sheep or, or lamb, then, you know, we can have potentially 300 in that uh, pen at that size. For ewes and lambs, it'd only be 15, but again, we'd prefer them out in, in a paddock anyway. Uh, for weaner cattle, at 10 square metres per head, we could fit 150. For yearling cattle or cow, dry cows, 15 metres per square, then we're about 100 head in there. And again, the cows and calves, it'd only be 15, but we'd really rather see them out in, in small paddocks. So by balancing those two together, both our, our stocking density and the mob size, that will come together to tell you how big a pen you actually need for these animals. So that's that starts to determine some of the calculations we'll do. And I'll, I will talk a little bit more about that um, in my next presentation in, a, in half an hour's time where I'll, I'll look at actually designing um, confinement feeding areas. But look, that's that's my presentation for now. So I'll just uh, hand back. Um, Jeff. Yeah. Um, Jeff. How, uh, Jeff Duddy is having some internet issues. Yep. Um, would it be possible to get you to um, run the the your next slide? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. No problem at all. Uh, yep. Apologies for this. He's. Um, it appears to have crashed on his end. Sorry, everyone. Ah, <laughs> oh, look, the wonders of technology. No, that's fine. Look, I'll, I'll go straight on. Um, so, look, the, the next sort of two topics I had, um, we're talking about pen design and, and infrastructure within pens. So it actually flows on, on quite nicely um, from what I was just talking about then. So... You know, we, we've potentially chosen a slight site that's that's hopefully got the topography we want, um, reasonably close to facilities and the like. And, you know, some of this stuff's a little bit of a recap already on, on what I've already said. So when we're looking at designing our, our confinement feeding area, um, we want that slope on our pen. So ideally our pens should slope from front to rear um, to facilitate good drainage. And when I say front to rear, um, I'm really talking about where really at the front of the pen, traditionally we, we would have the feed facilities and normally at the rear of the pen, we'd have have the water trough and the like. So um, I'll show some diagrams in a minute. So I've, I, I work a lot with um, with cattle feedlots as well. So I, I tend to sort of think of it as the front of the pen and the rear of the pen. Um, but yeah, we want some slope that, that goes from, from front to back so that we get good drainage. And ideally, if we've got a number of pens side by side, we want that drainage to go out the back of the pen, not to go um, from pen to pen. That's really what we're, we're trying to avoid. So, you know, ideally, you don't want pens on the side of a hill and having water run from one pen into the next one into the next one, because, you know, that, that can cause problems and issues, especially with a pen that's at the bottom of the hill. I think um, um, as I've already yeah. alluded to, your pen size is going to depend on, on your mob size's stocking rate and also the feed trough length. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment as well. 
we need to make sure we've got enough um, length of feed trough for the number of stock we've got as well. And Jeff, can can you share your yep. slide, please? Me. Yep. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> What's going on here? I thought I was still sharing. No, you you'd stopped sharing. Sorry, everyone. Sorry about that. And here we go. All right, can you see that now? Yep. That's come up? Yep. Excellent. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, apologies for that. Um, so look, yeah, so when we're designing our pens again, um, we need to consider stock and machinery movements is really important. So um, how are we going to get the stock to the containment area? And also what sort of machinery movements we might have in there? Um, we may have to go in and clean pens. Um, if we're feeding within the pens and we've got to get our machinery and you know a trailed unit potentially a feed wagon into the pen so we need to think about all those turning circles how much area we need to actually um, facilitate that and, and allow that to happen and look really as much as we can we, we want to try and exist utilize existing infrastructure so you know if there's fences we can use if there's existing laneways if we can tie it in with a laneway system on the property um, your existing stockyards that I mentioned before, and also your feed storage area. You know, we really don't want to be going out and, and having to you know, repeat everything and, and duplicate everything for our um, confinement feeding area. So the more we can tie it in and, and make all that work, um, the better it is. Of course, if, if you've got to start building sheds and stuff like that, then you know they may well require uh, development consent from your council for those sort of structures. So. You know, if you've got to go down that path, then then there may be some requirements. Just in terms of feed troughs, so really for all feed um, or containment uh, feeding areas, confinement feeding areas, um, we do strongly recommend that you use some form of troughing. So it's really to to reduce wastage, spoilage of the feed, and and also to reduce soil intake um, versus feeding grain or, or feed out on the ground. So um, we really do strongly recommend that in, in all of these facilities that you do have some form of troughing there that's between the, the feed and the ground so that um, animals aren't potentially wasting a heap of feed but then also uh, running into health issues by, by ingesting a lot of soil. So there, there's some issues that come with that. Feeding space, how, how long are the feeding troughs? So um, we work on for sheep, um, if they've only got access to one side of a trough, then 30 centimetres per head. Um, of course, if they can access to both sides, then, then you know you can halve that um, area. For weaner cattle, it's the same. It's about 30 centimetres per head. Yearling cattle, 40 centimetres, and, and adult cattle, 60 centimetres. Now, some people may, you know, there's there's a number of publications on on the web and the like um, that are for feedlot cattle and, and sheep. And often they will recommend a, a much smaller amount of trough space per head. But again, it, becomes, it comes back to how we're actually managing the animals that we're feeding there. So um, in a confinement feeding area, because again, we're often feeding less than what those animals can potentially eat, um, we, we do need to supply them with more space. So potentially all those animals can actually feed at once. In a commercial beef cattle feedlot, for example, um, there's probably likely to be feed in front of those animals, maybe 18, 20 hours of the day, maybe even longer. Um, so they'll often work on about a third of the pen being able to eat at once, um, a third of the pen sort of waiting to feed. And then, you know, in an ideal situation, you've got about a third of the pen that are sitting back and quite comfortable to, to rest and, and lay down, knowing that there'll be feed there still in the pen or in the feed bunk when they come up to it later. In a lot of cases where we're drought feeding, um, because we're not feeding to the maximum those animals can eat, then we do need that ability to feed all the animals at once. So these these numbers are a little bit more. And look, the more trough space we can give animals, the better. Um, we reduce the number of shy feeders we get. Um, we reduce the number of the issues we get by by providing more trough space. So you know the, these are really minimum amounts per head. 
If we're using self feeders, the numbers come way back again um, because we're working on the theory that there's going to be feed available there 24 hours a day. So animals can go there anytime and, and potentially feed. So the numbers per head are much smaller when we, we go to a, um, to a self feeder. And look, feed troughs don't have to be elaborate. Um, there's lots and lots of different styles of feed troughs that, that people use in confinement feeding areas. Uh, and as I, I move through my pen design diagrams, you'll see a lot more, but you know, simple like on the diagram there on the left, that shade cloth um, that's been formed into a bit of a trough there with a couple of wires. Um, it's something that's pretty easy to walk along and, and sort of remove any, any spoilt feed or dust or anything that gets in it up off the ground. Um, and if there's a rainfall event, then of course the water soaks through that quite quite effectively. So, you know, it, it's a, a relatively cheap and simple style of troughing. Um, cattle would probably cause it a bit of damage, but um, you know, for sheep that they can work quite well. Um, and there's some examples there for cattle where you know the, the top diagram there where they've used a bit of corrugated iron and, and welded some pipe together to to form a trough there for for some calves. And down the bottom there, we've got a diagram where they've cut the wall out of a tractor tire, put a little bit of rubber belting over the hole in the bottom, um, and that makes a, you know a really quite effective uh, feed trough there. You know, there's ten cows. You know, you're probably quite quite comfortable fit a dozen cows around a, a tractor tire like that. I suppose one word of caution there: just just be a little bit careful um, with the wall of the tire there. If if it's a, a steel belted um, tire that you know you, the animals you you're just mindful there's not wire being exposed there because sometimes the animals will chew on that and rub on it, it can come loose and, and actually cause issues um, if cattle ingest that or, or sheep ingest it so just be a little bit wary that there's there's not wire exposed there um, but otherwise you know tractor tires can make really really good feed troughs well, I'll show a lot more examples of feed troughs as, as I move along through through this presentation as well. But look, just some different layouts um, for pens. Um, these are you know stylized type diagrams where we've got three pens here, and we've got a laneway across the top here. This is an example where um, we can feed the the animals separate to where they're held, so that the animals are held in these three pens. Um, we come along the laneway. We deposit the feed on the troughing out here, and then you know you'd, you'd close the gates on the laneway, and you'd let one pen of animals out at a time to to feed on that troughing. So, so the advantage of this type of system, um, you know, you, you're limiting the cost of troughing because you're actually potentially feeding um, three pens with with one set of troughing. You're also um, being able to deliver feed outside the pen, so you don't have animals. Um, that you could potentially run over, which which can become an issue when you're feeding within the pen. Um, so you don't have the animals there obstructing, but it, it can take a, a, well, will take a lot longer to feed if you're feeding every day, because you do need to sort of feed one group of animals, um, let them consume their feed, put them back in the pen, and then, you know, feed out a second group. So it, it can add a bit of time to, to the amount of time that it takes to feed out. Um, but it does have some cost savings in, in that type of situation. And this is an example of one on a property. This was a photo that, that um, I think Brett or Pete took um, where they've got pens, um, you know, the pens are running up the hill uh, and we've got the, the feed troughs down here. They're outside of the pens, um, so the animals can be let out and then feed in, in those those areas um, without having to worry about running over them and, and the like. So, you know, just again, simple troughs just made out of corrugated iron up here, held up with iron posts. So just form into a, a little bit of a dish there. Um, another option for for your layout is, is troughing down the middle of the pen. Um, so again, in the first example, animals can, can feed on both sides. So again, you, you reduce the length of troughing you need for, to feed the number of animals because it's the linear distance down either side, they can feed from both sides. Then, you know, for for every meter of, of troughing, you can feed twice as many animals. So, you know, you've got troughing down the middle of these pens. Um, you could potentially, uh, some some documents talk about uh, rotating animals in pens. 
So potentially you could have two groups of animals in two of these pens, put the feed out in the third pen, move animals into that pen, and then feed out in, in the next pen, um, move the animals again. Um, that again alleviates the, the need to have the animals in the pen while you're feeding, but it does mean that you've got additional cost in terms of troughing and, and fences and the like. So you know, more often than not, people will just have the troughing in the middle of the pen or the small paddock, um, and they'll deliver in there with the stock in, in the pen. Uh, so again, just in this diagram, I, I didn't mention in the first one, you know, I'm talking the, the laneway or the roadway here is at the front of the pen, so the ground's sloping away from that, so it's draining away from the lane and the roadway. And we're using that lane and roadway, so the laneway to move the stock, and it's also the roadway that we're, we're coming to, um, to deliver the feed in. These are a couple of examples of, um, and this is a small paddock system where they've just got you know a long length of, of troughing here. It's just um, sheets of trim deck there on the ground. Um, they're using as a, a form of trough, uh, but you know in this situation you've got to drive into the pen to deliver feed to it. Um, and here's another example where you know they're, they're using um, you know metal again as a form of, of sheeting. Um, they're purlins. And you know they've got number a number of different sites for for animals to to feed. Now that can be an advantage as well, by rather than having one long um, feed out feed trough, by having multiple feed troughs like that, you can actually reduce the amount of um, the number of shy feeders. So that can be an advantage again. Of course, the disadvantage of this is you do actually have to drive in here to um to feed these animals. So that is a risk. There, another layout that we can have, um, and you know we see this with a lot of commercial feedlots, uh, is where the troughing's right at the top front of the pen, and so you're delivering feed into that troughing um, from the roadway. You're not having to actually enter the pens at all, um, and the animals are sticking their heads through the the fence there to to access that feed. Now that eliminates the need to enter the pen. Um, now you've only got animals feeding from one side of the trough. So, you know, to feed the same number of animals, you, you now need twice as much troughing, um, but it, it is a, a really effective means of doing it. And, you know, here's a couple of examples here. Um, you'll notice this one here, the animals, uh, oops, not sure what happened there. Um, the animals uh, are feeding through the fence. It's actually got um, electric wires there, so um, to stop them pushing on it too hard. But you'll notice this pen is actually quite shallow. It's not, not very deep from front to back. Um, and it's got a really nice long feed trough on it. So that's how they're, they're getting enough feeding space for that number of animals. Um, but it doesn't need to be an excessively deep pen. So it's it's quite effective. And, you know, again, here's some simple examples. So that last one was, was concrete troughing. Um, the one on the left here is, is like a poly belt. Um, that's been used and the one one on the right there is conveyor building, um, which is relatively simple. Being on the ground like that, um, do need to be a little bit careful the stock don't push feed away from themselves too much. Sometimes you might have to run along and, and actually push that feed back into them. Um, but it does reduce the amount of wastage um, by only having the, the animals move, be able to, to go through from one side. They're not walking over the feed and they're not not pushing feed out of the feed trough um, on um, uh, being able to move over it. Jeff, you're, um, it's just stopped sharing again, your screen there for a reason. I think you may have shared the wrong screen, Jeff. No, no I'm, let's go back. Oh, dear. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened there. I haven't been playing, I promise, Jeff. I'm not yeah, playing. it's you, Brett. I know. So can you you see that one again now? Yes, we can yeah, see it again. It. Thank you. Sorry. No, I had something flash up on the screen, so maybe that's what, what caused it. Okay. So, yeah, again, so a couple of simple designs there. Can you still see it? I'm having the Microsoft Teams. No, it drop, no. dropped out again. It's dropped out yeah, again. The Microsoft Teams um, window keeps... Um, maybe there's someone waiting in the lobby. I'm not sure whether that's impacting it. I'll admit all again. Yeah, it just keep popped up on my screen again for some reason. All right, can you see that again? Yes, see that. Here we go. Um, so yeah, couple of simple designs there, belting 
on the right hand side and, and the, the rubber matting uh, on the left. Um, another type of design where feed troughs uh, are in the fence line and so animals can actually feed from both sides. So this allows you to have a pen, um, but it, it allows animals to feed from both sides. So, you know, you, you could, can have troughing in each fence line like I've got in this diagram, or in some examples, people will only have troughing between two pens. Um, so they'll have one lot of troughing and, and animals can feed from both sides. Of course, challenge, you, you do have to enter the pen to, to feed out in this situation. So. You know, that is a little bit of a drawback, but once again, you've got animals that are feeding from both sides. And because it's running in a fence line, you, you don't have animals moving across the troughing. Um, so you do tend to get less wastage and less spoilage for that, that type of reason as well. So this is an example of that on, on a property. This is a photo Brett took. Um, I assume you lost it again. Yep. Yep. Sorry, every, every time it, it tells me there's somebody waiting in the lobby, I um, it stops sharing my screen. Right, yeah. So, um, yeah, so this is a photo Brett took where the, the animals can actually access from both sides here. So there's actually a pen on either side here um, and those animals can access from both sides. So it's, again, saving, saving some trough space um, in terms of cost but it means you've got to drive in that pen to be able to feed out. Um, Self-feeders. So there's you know, a, a large number of people will use self-feeders, um, especially for sheep where, you know, they're, they're trying to limit uh, intake. Really hard to do that with cattle, uh, especially with a, a total mixed ration. So a ration that includes the, the hay or, or the straw. Um, where you place a self-feeder in a pen, really depends on on what sort of setup you've got with your feed out equipment. So some will have self feeders a bit like a trough right up against the fence. The cattle or the stock can only access from one side. Um, on these types of systems, you, you need an elevator that can get feed in there, but it, it's the shortest elevator of any of the options um, because you, you're really driving along on the outside of the pen and, and feeding straight in there. Um, some I've seen where they've moved them, they're still running parallel to that front fence, but they've moved it out a little bit. So now the stock can actually access the self-feeder from both sides. Um, of course, if you're delivering from outside on the roadway, you, you need a, a longer elevator that allows you to deliver feed into that self-feeder. Um, so it depends on the equipment you've got or, or what you're looking at. So if you're looking at buying equipment, make sure you take that into mind. Um, another example is where you have the self-feeder at 90 degrees to that fence line. Um, again, this takes quite a, a, a high elevator to actually allow you to feed that um, self-feeder evenly. Or alternatively, you've got the self-feeder somewhere in the pen and you've got to drive into the pen to feed it. But, you know, those last three examples, you're, you're utilising both sides of the self-feeder. So um you, you from one a single self feeder you, you've got double the trough space of what you have in, in the first example um and just some you know examples this was one uh locally out here at forbes this was a small feedlot where they they built their own self feeders um and that self feeders in the fence line so they fill it from outside and then the, the stock have access to it um or this is an example of one where um, it's parallel to the, the fence line, but it's in a little bit, so the stock can access, access both sides of that. But again, you're needing a, a longer elevator to get up and fill it. Or this last example here where it's perpendicular um, to the fence line. So you're needing quite a, quite a height and, and length in an elevator to, um, to be able to fill that from outside the pen and be able to still fill it evenly. So it really depends on the equipment you've got as, as to what you, what you can do. Just in last sort of point in terms of, or a couple of points in terms of pen layouts, where you place your water. Um, look, traditionally, I would talk about, you know, if your feed's at the top of the pen, you put your water at the bottom of the slope. Um, what we're aiming to do there is really maximise the distance between the two, because as animals eat, they're actually going to be um, keeping grain and the like on their muzzles. And so if the water's too close, then they will drop a lot of that grain in the water and, and you know, spoil the water quite quickly. So it will require um, more often that you're cleaning out the water troughs. Having the water troughs at the bottom of the pen like this too, 
you align them so the bung in the water trough is in the bottom fence line. So when you actually take that bung out and you clean the water trough, all that water goes outside the pen. So you're not creating a wet patch within the pen. So that's another really big advantage to having those water troughs down low in the pen like that. Um, alternative is that you, you have them up a little bit from the fence. Um, sometimes the ones in the fence line can make um, moving stock a little bit difficult. Uh, if you try got to move them around the fence to, to get them back out of the pen. So sometimes you'll see water troughs moved up a little bit. Um, look, you've stock have got access to both sides. Um, so that's great. Ideally in this type of situation, if you can actually set up a plumbing type system so that that waste water goes straight outside the pen, that's ideal. Um, this is sort of an example of what will happen, of course, if if you're cleaning out your water troughs and we really encourage you to clean them out regularly. Um, but unfortunately, you then end up with water in the pen and, and you can end up with quite wet patches in that pen when the, the water troughs uh, a little bit up from the, the bottom of the pen. Another alternative is you put the, the water trough in the fence line. The advantage here um, is that every pen has access to two water troughs, um, but there is an additional cost because, you know, for the four pens, you've actually got five water troughs. So, you know, there's additional cost there, but you do have um, a little bit of, of a safety margin there in terms of you've got an extra water trough in each pen. Uh, again, I'd recommend with these types of systems, if you can plumb that water trough down so that when you clean it, that water goes outside the pen. Uh, for cattle, these work really, really well because um, again, your fence line then becomes that barrier that stops the animals from, from hopping into the water trough. Um, cattle will love to get up and put their front feet in the water trough. So this, in this example, your, your fence actually becomes um, the barrier that stops them doing that. Probably the last one in terms of water troughs is having the water trough um, running sort of parallel to the fence line. I really encourage people not to do this. Um, in that example, where it's right on the fence line, you, you only have one, the stock only have access to one side of the water trough, but also as the water and any manure and the like comes down, drains down from that pen, um, you're also potentially stopping that and, and blocking that that from moving out of the pen. So uh, it can impede the drainage. So much prefer to see um, the water troughs running sort of uh, at 90 degrees to, to the bottom fence of the pen. Um, talking about fencing, look, realistically for confinement areas, fencing doesn't have to be elaborate. Uh, for sheep, you know, ring lock fencing is, is more than adequate. Uh, for cattle, you know, some electric wires off, off plain wire fence um, is is perfect. You know, there's there's no need to go to to really heavy duty fences. Um, really recommend people don't use barbed wire in, in these um, setups. That, that does cause damage to hides and scratching and the like. So, you know, electric fencing is a really good option. Um, you know, more feedlot type pens. Um, you know, cable used extensively for cattle. Um, you know, through timber posts. Uh, all of these types of structures, you know, good end assemblies are needed for cattle, but also be mindful too, if you're putting calves in there, um, that your, your wires down low are close enough to actually keep those calves in the pens, uh, which can be a little bit of a tr problem with these these types of structures. There's no reason why you can't use ring lock for, for cattle um, and just put a couple of hot offset electric wires off there to protect it, um, and that'll work quite fine. Look, that's all I've got around pen design. I'll just again move out of this and um, I'll unshare my screen. Well, hopefully I've already done that, Brett. So you can um, you can pick up the screen and then yeah, if we've got people that have got questions uh, down the track, we'll we'll try and answer those at the end. Yep. Um, thanks, Brett. Thanks for that, Jeff. Um, Jeff's just trying to. Um, uh, share his screen here now. He's having some real connection issues, so we're trying to work that out. Um, question was just asked about um, shade and wind breaks. Yep. Yeah. Look, we'll we'll talk about that in more detail next week at next week's um, webinar. Um, but yes, yeah, so I I really strongly recommend um, shade for cattle um, and and also for sheep from a welfare perspective. Um, so if we can, we can sort of design these areas either with artificial shade or if we can utilise, um, you know, trees or the like that might be there. But again, we'll talk about it next week. But, you know, we've got to make sure if there are trees in these areas that we protect them. 
um, both from damage from the stock, but also um, we've got to be a little bit careful of nutrient buildup over time. So um, we'll talk a, a bit more about that next week, but yeah, really mm. strong advocate of, of providing shade and also being um, mindful of of wind directions, especially during the winter with sheep. So, um, you know, if you've got cold winds during the winter, uh, if you've got some sort of shelter there to protect those animals from those cold winds in winter, that's great. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we don't restrict airflow too much during the summer. Uh, if it starts to get hot, then we want that airflow to um, to try and hopefully cool those animals. Jeez, thanks, Jeff. Um, while we're just um, waiting for for Jeff's screen, uh, Jeff uh, Duddy's screen to um, go to a bigger size, um, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, next week, uh, we'll we'll send an email out uh, with a link for next week's session. There, there's no need to register. Okay, Jeff, are you you there? Yep. Jeff Duddy. Yeah, mate. You can hear me. Okay. Um, yep. I've just uh, got a question there too about um, joining in in confinement areas. Would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I think it's a great management tool. Um, and I think the question was, do we need to change the stocking density? But no, not at all. That uh, stocking densities are based on on shy feeders, uh, risk of that sort of thing, and, and providing enough access for the feed. So a lot of producers are now using those confinement areas as a really good way to increase conception rates. So no, you wouldn't need to change them. No worries, I'll hand over to you now, mate. Yeah, okay. Can you see my screen at all? I haven't got it in presentation mode, mate. I've just got it. Yes, we Oops. can. And you just if you put it to presentation mode, we're on your first screen. Right, eh? We'll see how we go. So has that come on? Yes, it has. Excellent. Sorry about this, everyone. We're um, living in the burn docks up in southern Queensland. A quick shout out. I've just had a quick look at some of the names on the... Um, on the participants list. So Stan and Chris from down at Leeton, welcome. And a few of the ex workmates. So great to see you on board. Um, Jeff, thanks for doing those two sections uh, back to back. I'm, again, I apologize for the uh, in internet issues we're having. We'll see how we go. Just let us know, Brett, has that um, moved on? Just as I mute myself, yes. <laughs> What I'd like to run through first up is um, just a few brief things on un understanding feed quality terms. This is particularly important uh, with the session we're going to be talking about next week with feeding byproducts and alternate feeds. But I just thought, thought it was important that we look at, um, at a few of these to start with. Um, we're going to look at dry matter. Now, all, all feed tests are done on a dry matter basis, so as if all moisture is removed. So they're brought back to a common base we're going to quickly look at digestibilities, energy, protein, and two terms called acid detergent fibre and neutral detergent fibre and how you can use those when making up rations. In terms of digestible dry matter, it's the percentage of the feed that's actually used or digested by the animal. On your feed test, if that dry matter digestibility is greater than 65%, it uh, basically relates to high quality feed. If it's below 55%, it's poor quality feed and probably won't maintain live weight. It's actually estimated from this acid detergent fibre, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. Metabolizable energy, uh, it's calculated from a feed's digestibility. It's the amount of energy available for maintenance and production. It's expressed as megajoules of ME per kilogram of dry matter. Crude protein, it's a measure of a feed's nitrogen content. Okay, so it includes both true protein that the animal consumes and non-protein nitrogen. Now, an example of non-protein nitrogen is something like urea. It's not protein, but it's providing nitrogen for the bugs in the gut to use um, to actually convert to protein. And it's expressed as a percentage of dry matter. This acid detergent fibre, it actually estimates the portion of feed that's indigestible to stock. Okay, so if it's a high value, so the ADF value is greater than, say, 25, it basically indicates a low dry matter digestibility and a low energy content. So the higher the ADF value, the poorer the quality of the feed. 
the neutral detergent fibre, it's used to predict voluntary feed intake. We, there's an equation I'll show you on the next slide. And the availability of net energy. Low values, say less than 20, indicate that the feed is high in energy, it's highly digestible and has a potentially high voluntary intake rate. An example of a low NDF feed would be something like cereal grains. The lower the NDF, the more the animal will eat. Now we can use this NDF, this neutral detergent fibre, to sort of look at, okay, what is the potential intake for some of these feeds? If we look at barley in this example, we, it has an NDF value of, say, 20. So 120 divided by 20 means they can potentially eat 6% of their body weight in terms of uh, potential intake. Almond holes, uh, not as digestible. They can eat only 2.7% of that. And oat straw, which everyone would understand is reasonably indigestible, um, potentially they could only eat around about 2% maximum or 1.8% of their body weight. So we can use that NDF um, feed test value to actually start to sort of say, okay, if we're feeding this or a combination of, of um, different feeds, um, what is the potential for the animals to actually eat enough to actually do what we want them to do in the confinement area? When it comes to calculating actual feed requirements, the um, dry matter intakes, it depends on live weight, feed quality and class of stock or their physiological state. In general, cattle and sheep will consume around one and a half to two percent of their live weight if they're on dry feed or poor quality feed. Around two and a half to three percent if they're on average quality pasture or hay. And anywhere from three and a half to five percent of their live weight if they're fed high grain or feedlot rations uh, with minimal roughage. There's a couple of graphs taken from New South Wales DPI Managing Drought Booklet, um, which I'm just going to use. They're a quick and easy way to work out uh, ballpark figures for how much we need to feed. This first one is uh, for ewes or for sheep. And the left hand column is the ewe live weight. Energy intake is that uh, second line, and the third line, vertical line, is the kilograms of feed required. And how we use this. We say, okay, it's a 50 kilogram U. We're giving them a ration around about 12 megajoules of energy. And to give you an idea, that would be, say, 90% barley, 10% reasonable quality hay. We draw a line through that ration energy content, and it says, okay, to maintain live weight, the dry sheep needs around 540 grams of that ration a day. If she's a heavier ewe, say 55 kilograms in this case, on the same ration, the feed requirements are greater. That makes sense because heavier ewes have greater body reserves and they tend to eat more. That's around about a 10% increase in feed required, just on a body weight basis. If it's a 50 kilogram ewe, but she's only receiving a 8 megajoules of energy ration, her daily requirement pops up to about 950 grams a day, which is about a 75% increase um, from the feeding a 12 megajoule ration. So we've got to take into account uh, live weight, um, the ration content, energy content, and importantly, also conversion factors depending on the physiological state. That little box at the bottom of the graph that I've just put up, saying late pregnancy, a conversion factor of 1.7. So we need to take into account if they're late pregnant, we'd have to times um, that first example for a 50 kilogram U on a 12 megajoules of energy by about 1.7. So all of a sudden her energy requirements now go up to 920 or her intake goes to 920 grams. So we need to take that into account. Exactly the same process with the cattle side. Just two examples, if we uh, have a 300 kilogram animal, on 10 megs of energy, they need around about four kilos of feed a day of that ration. If they're 500 kilos on the same energy intake, they'll need about five and a half kilos. If they're 500 kilos, but again, they're on a lower energy, uh, this in this case, again, an eight megs of energy, that bumps up to seven and a half kilograms 
per feed a day. And similarly, we need to take into account their stage of production, whether or not they're dry, mid-pregnant, late-pregnant, calving and the like, and make amendments to those, uh, those ballpark figures for daily feed intake. In terms of grains, we're going to go through cereal grains and pulses to a lesser degree. But cereal grains will be the primary feed used within most, confi most confinement feeding systems. Much of their energy is stored as starch. They provide protein, vitamins, minerals and some fibre. And I'm going to walk you through a slide in a second looking at the differences between the various grains in terms of most of those things. In terms of pulse grains and meals, your pulses like your lupins, peas, beans, and your processed meals like canola meal, cottonseed meal, soybean meal, they're basically used to improve protein level, to bump protein levels up. On an energy basis, they're usually more expensive than cereal grains, so we turn to these when we need to meet the protein requirements, um, particularly for younger stock. In terms of processing, um, this is where sheep and cattle differ. For sheep, there are little to no benefits if you crack or process any cereal grains, um, but there may be some advantages in cracking your pulses to prevent sorting. Um, sheep are very good at sorting pulses in particular, the larger grains um, out of cell feeders. Um, for cattle, some degree of processing will improve grain utilisation and digestibilities, and most um, people confinement feeding cattle would look at processing to some degree. On the processing side, it usually involves something like grinding using a hammer mill or a disc mill, dry rolling or tempering, adding water to the, to the grain. It's important though to, to recognise and to realise and remember that over-processing grain increases acidosis risk. Now we tend to like to use the term acidosis more so than grain poisoning because you can get acidosis from grazing um, crops that are high in sugars. You can get acidosis from feeding pellets. So we, we tend to use the term acidosis more so than grain poisoning. The reason over-processing increases at risk is that it, we're breaking the, the, the um, seed apart. We're increasing the surface area for the bugs in the rumen to get to the starch. Um, and, and fermentation rates really sort of increase when that happens. Um, and starch is the principal driver of acidosis. In general terms, looking at this from wheat to triticale all the way down to oats and lupins, that's generally why those at the top of the slide um, are more dangerous in terms of acidosis. They are higher in starch and lower in fibre. Those on the bottom of the slide, low in starch, high in fibre, higher in oil. A lot of information on this slide. I just want to walk you through a few things. If we look at the various grains going down this side, and we've also got here brewer's grains and dry distiller grains and cottonseed, but there's not a huge difference really in energy contents in per kilogram of dry matter. It's where that energy comes from is the important thing. If we look at the ones that are really in the ballpark when it comes to providing extra protein, as I mentioned, you've got your pulses, um, your lupins, peas and beans, but your brewers, DDGs and cottonseed um, are actually quite good um, protein levels as well. These top four, wheat, triticale, corn and sorghum, this is why they are the most dangerous when it comes to acidosis risk. 70% plus of the grain is, is starch. They tend to be a little bit lower in oil. Oil's quite a good energy content with some reservations for feeding. We'll talk about that in a second and they're quite low in fibre, so high starch, low fibre, high risk. In terms of barley and oats, and barley is the pick of the grains for both sheep and cattle. Um, it tends to be more palatable and have a better range of vitamins and minerals. Um, and it's not as dangerous, principally because it is lower in starch than the wheat, triticale grains and the like. Oats is generally safe because, you know, we're looking 40, 45% of the grain is actually starch, much lower than, again, wheat or triticale. They have a higher oil component, which provides a lot of energy. Oil provides about two and a half times the energy of starch. And importantly, they have higher fibre. 
Brewers grains, DDGs, cottonseed. Starch levels in the processed grains there, your brewers and DDGs are quite low. So theoretically, they're really safe when it comes to acidosis risk. Um, oil, they're reasonably high in oil, particularly cottonseed, which can uh, sort of really cause some problems if we get too much, um, too much oil in the diet. Generally for our sheep and cattle or ruminants, seven or eight percent of total oil in the diet um, starts to muck the rumen up and start to have some problems. So we we set, tend to target less than 7% total oil in the diet. Again, lupins, lupins, this is why it is the safest of all the grains that we feed. It has less than 10% of its grain contained starch. A lot of the energy is coming from oil and sugar in the lupins. And again, with our peas and beans, very similar rates of starts say eight so on the same sort of level there in terms of acidosis risk um, one thing to be careful of there if you do process those we again we can increase the risk of bugs getting to that starch so i wouldn't crack those too much just a couple of quick points on some of these corn and sorghum corn and sorghum both have what's called as bypass starts where a lot of the starts will actually bypass breakdown in the rumen and is converted principally to glucose or energy source in the small intestine. But that can lead to some acidosis, subclinical acidosis. Um, but it does provide additional energy from those two grains. Um, the sorghum has things called tannins, uh, um, which basically can bind up protein. Uh, and sorghum is not really a pick of grains when we come to sheep, and it does need to be processed. Um, and I would recommend probably processing sorghum. Uh, if you want to get full bang for your buck when feeding to sheep. Brewers and DDGs, some of their issues tend to be high sulphur, very low calcium to phosphorus, like all the calcium to phosphorus ratio, like all our cereal grains are. Uh, and it can they can have decreased digest, digestibility. Lupins, peas and beans, they have what's called um, anti-nutritionals like tannins, trypsin, protease inhibitors, um, which basically can tie up a bit of protein. Um, but really they are a protein source so I'm not too worried about those and and basically we only feed 10 to 20 percent max in most rations. In terms of energy it's the most important indicator of feed quality particularly during dry times. It's needed for muscle development, fat storage, maintenance and growth. Most people seem to think during droughts that protein is the limiting factor. Most times it's going to be energy. That energy comes in a couple of different forms. Your carbohydrates, like your starch and your sugars, you know, 15 to 18 megajoules per kilo. Protein, protein can be used. Excess protein can be used, but it's a reasonably inefficient way of, of getting energy, extra energy into the animal. Um, as I mentioned, oil has around about two, two and a half times the energy value of starch. So as I've just walked you through that table, depending on the level of each of these within the grain or the ration will depend on their on their production state um, or how they perform. In terms of protein, protein is needed for muscle development. It drives appetite and it's important for wool production. Young lambs, young velas, um, very high protein requirements because they're trying to build body. They're trying to put muscle on. That protein requirement drops away as they age. Um, and we'll show you the, the energy protein requirements of the different classes in a second. Importantly, if we don't have enough protein, what happens is we lead to a reduction in the number of bugs in the gut. That slows digestion down. There'll be a drop in intake and a, a drop in production. So we need to ensure that protein levels are maintained. Um, in terms of both sheep and cattle, your protein and energy values uh, or requirements are shown there in that table. You'll see for survival or maintenance, protein levels are quite low, 6 to 7%. Um, and energy is about 8 meg, so quite low. So for maintenance, mature stock can get through on a pretty basic ration. Um, for growth, lactation, late pregnancy, that's when we start to see energy and protein requirements really sort of go through the roof. And in terms of finishing lambs, um, my rough rule of thumb is, depending on the weight of lamb admittedly, but the rough rule of thumb is whatever the energy content of your ration is, 
Add two, and that should balance up energy and protein, except if they're very light lambs, say 15, 20, 25 kilos live weight. In that case, um, again, we need to balance up energy and protein, but if we're feeding, say, 12 megs of energy ration, we have here 20, 30, 40, and 50 kilogram weight lambs on the same energy intake. A 20 kilo lamb is going to need around 16 to 17% protein on a 12 megajoule diet. So we need to bump that up. A 40 kilogram lamb, which is probably two thirds to mature weight, needs around about 14%, so that plus two that I mentioned, that rule of thumb of whatever the energy is, add two, and that should be the ballpark for your protein needs for those heavier style lambs. In terms of um, pelleted diets, and I will say in this last drought, um, pellets were pretty competitive. I'm usually pretty hard on pellets, um, only because they'll probably cost 70 to $80 ballpark figures. Um, more per ton compared to if you made that ration or the equivalent energy and protein ration up on farm. But they can be effective in a convenient addition to or an alternative to grain based rations. In the pelletizing process, what happens? They moisten and mix all the feed together. It's conditioned with steam that can coagulates or binds the ingredients and aids in breaking down the outer layer of starch, and this increases the digestibility to feed. They force all that through a dye, they cut it to size, cool it and dry it, and it has about 90% dry matter when it's finished, which is pretty much what most grains have as well. Various forms of pellets, we've included these various um, forms in the manual. Um, you can have fibre only, say a loosened base pellet. They're most made principally from 100% forage. Um, they may include some additives. Um, Roughage-based pellets are less likely to cause acidosis than grain-based pellets because they're coming from a source that's low in starch or sugars. You can buy a complete feed pellet. Um, they provide energy, which is usually through things like cereal grains, mill run, grain products, um, molasses. Uh, protein from pulses, meals, or even urea, roughage and additives like your vitamins, minerals, and buffers to help um, mitigate the effect of acidosis. Most, however, are cereal grain based, and you need to keep that in in um, in mind when feeding pellets. Don't change, even if you're buying from the same pellet manufacturer. Don't change cold from the last batch you bought to the next batch because this next batch may have been made from a barley base, whereas the what you were feeding might have been a wheat base, right? So as you do with grains, shandy the next batch over. You can buy concentrated feed pellets. They're principally a supplement looking to correct the deficiency and or improve intake and performances of the stock. They generally constitute between one to 5% of intake. So they're an additive, a pellet additive that you would generally put in with your grain based ration. And you can also look at pre-mixed feed pellets. They're basically feed additives only. They can include trace elements, vitamins, minerals, or things called ionophores like Bovatec or Rumensin. They're generally less than 1% of an animal's intake, um, and they can be, again, included within a ration or offered as free choice. Pelleted feeds are available in a variety of sizes. Um, and when we talk size, we're generally talking the diameters of the pellets and lengths. They generally range between 5 to 10 millimetres for sheep and up to about 25 millimetre in diameter for cattle. Generally, larger pellets tend to have more fibre because they need that additional fibre to help with the drying process when they're making the pellet. And this may help to increase chewing and rumination. Um, now that's important and we'll talk about that next week when we talk about the importance of fibre um, because we stimulate chewing. Sheep and cattle will chew under normal grazing conditions 30 to 40,000 times a day and while they're doing that they're producing biocarbon soda um, which helps to try and maintain the rumen in a neutral type state. So it aids with acidosis. Uh, larger pellets may however have slightly lower digestibility 
capabilities and the, the finer pellets. And again, that's generally related to the fibre content they need to put in there. But they are less prone to loss when trail feeding, uh, if you're not using troughing. The pros and cons, we'll do this quickly and then we'll just summarise and finish up. Advantages of pellets may include ease of use, particularly when estimating feeding rates. It's a lot easier to actually weigh out the pellets and feed them out. They are generally seen as a complete or balanced ration, giving a good mix of energy, protein, fibre, vitamins, minerals and the like. They may reduce acidosis and other health risks. That really depends on the, the um, grain content. Um, and the additives that are included in that pellet. Importantly for manufacturers, they can use a wide range of feed elements that are difficult to feed or poor quality products. Things like mill run, holes, husks, antibiotics and ionophores can be included in pellets, which are, a lot of times are very hard for producers to actually administer or include those themselves. Other advantages or pros, you can have a decrease in feed wastage, dust, fines or spoilage compared to feeding grain and hay um, separately. Um, there are a lot of commercial racks and feeders on the market. Um, I still struggle to see any any commercial rack, particularly hay racks that, that are really minimising waste to the level that we need to. Um, they reduce selection or substitution of feed grain. So instead of being able to sort a ration, they've just got bang, one, one feed type in front of them if they're a commercial um, straight feed pellet. And they can lead to improvements in performance, basically because we are starting to meet the energy and or protein needs of that animal. But with all the uh, positives, there's always some negatives. Disadvantages of pellets can include increased engorgement or acidosis risk. Right, so we've got to be careful, particularly when introducing, because they can gorge on them. Um, there can certainly mean palatability or sorting issues, particularly um, the additive type pellets that we put in uh, a grain-based ration. They tend to have a shorter retention time in the gut, and this can lead to an increase in intake, lowered feed conversion efficiencies. We certainly see at times powdering issues. Um, and this relates principally to the poor quality feed that goes into some of these pellets, particularly during drought. Um, generally, the smaller the pellet, the more force is needed during the uh, pelletising uh, process. And so there's tend to be less powdering in the smaller pellets compared to the larger pellets. Generally, their cost per unit of energy or protein tends to be more than if you made your own gray or grain and hay rations up. Um, and as I said, Normally I'm pretty hard on pellets, but during this last draft they were very price competitive when it comes to energy and protein. They tend to lead to a decrease in eating or chewing time, this production of saliva that I mentioned before, um, and increasing acidosis risk. So to their credits, most pellet manufacturers will recommend that you put additional roughage um, out with the animals when feeding these to stimulate that cud chewing and, and, and saliva production. And finally, the heating during the pelleting process can decrease the availability of amino acids. Amino acids are the building block of protein. So it can effectively tie up a bit of protein and or destroy some vitamins. So there's pros and cons with using pellets. Um, you know, infrastructure on farm, equipment on farm, may well advocate that you uh, prefer pellets. Um, there's certainly a, a big range of pellet manufacturers out there now, uh, a lot of options. Um, it's a means of actually doing your figures and costing those compared to preparing rations um, using grain and hay, uh, whether it's as a total mixed ration or fed separately. So just to finish up for this week, feed tests are important. If you're buying feed in, ask for a feed test and or feed test your own grains um, or when you buy something in. If you can do it before, that would be great. Energy is the driver. Energy is the critical part, component. Be careful of acidosis if feeding cereal grains and or some pelleted diets. We'll talk about health um, issues next, next week um, and some of the other health and or disease issues we may face in confinement systems. And importantly, feed to your livestock's needs. So understand their physiological stage and their requirements. 
and feed a minimum in terms of energy and or protein to that particular um, stage of production. Thanks, Brady. Well, I owe you a beer, well, Duddy. I said there's no way you'd actually finish up on time. Um, well, thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining in tonight. Um, we will keep it uh, fairly simple. If you've got some questions you want answered, please feel free to email me and I'll put them to both Jeffs and myself and, and we'll get them together. Next week, we're doing uh, the, the second part. We'll be talking about feeds, alternatives and byproducts, fibre requirements, minerals, vitamins, etc. cetera. Um, we'll also be covering water, water requirements, shade, shelter, covering health and welfare, sort of some of the things that we've learnt. Uh, really, one of the things we, we, we have picked up over the last few years, us three together and we've spoken about is, is some of this, this welfare stuff, um, some of the health benefits that we're getting through some of the social side of things and that so hang with us there and then finally there's a budgeting tools and calculators and resources so um i said we'd, we'd try to finish up right on time and uh, we're there so thanks very much everyone for hanging in with us um and and getting through the uh, issues that we we had with connections um if you've got any questions please feel free to to punch them through to myself um and and we can go from there so thanks very much everyone uh for coming along and uh we'll leave it there thank you thanks brady thanks brett